thanks again to everyone for joining us. Um, we're going to share with you some of our um, some of the work we've been doing for probably the last 12 to 14 years, I would say now. And, um, you know, this is an exciting uh, new field. Um, there's a lot of good information that we wanted to share. Um, this is just gonna be sort of the tip of the iceberg, but at least kind of whet your appetite for what's what's coming and what's already the work that's already been done. Um, I'm Chris Rogers. I'm a board certified physical medicine and rehab doctor. I've uh, been practicing in San Diego since 1998. I was actually on faculty at UCSD for a number of years in the department of orthopedics. And then I, and then I started um, private practice uh, in 2000. Um, I'm fellowship trained in interventional pain management. I did a, a spying program in Texas with uh, Paul Dreyfus and Kevin Paza um, and uh, founded this office, which is in Carlsbad, uh, called San Diego Orthobiologics um, in 2016, uh, because it was obvious to me that uh, cell-based therapies were going to play a huge role in orthopedic medicine, and I just wanted to be a part of it. Uh, I'm also a medical director for a uh, company called Personalized Stem Cells, which is a sponsor for FDA-approved clinical trials of adipose-derived stem cells. So we have uh, we just finished a phase one clinical study and then we've got two phase two studies getting ready to go here soon. Um, and then uh, I also co-founded a company called Data Biologics, which is a um, app-based uh, patient registry. So our patients can record their clinical outcomes and adverse events. And so we can have a sense of what's happening uh, with uh, real world data. And then you all know Dr. Ambach, or I think many of you know Dr. Ambach. Um, I don't know. Why don't you introduce yourself, Dr. Rafak? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, you know, I'm. Uh, you know me. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I need to introduce myself. <laughs> Just like everyone, I'm board certified physical medicine rehab, uh, also board certified pain medicine. I decided I wanted to uh, switch my practice more to regenerative medicine, so I did the training, did another fellowship um, in LA at Ortho Healing Center. And that's when I really got involved with orthobiologics, um, got my training, been exposed to um, different um, specialists in the field, met Chris. Uh, we were both uh, teaching in uh, conferences and uh, faculty at Cadaver Lab. So that's how we met. And I decided um, that um, I wanted to go back to San Diego and join Chris, um, who is the uh, leader in locally uh, with regards to regenerative medicine. And I'm so glad you joined me. <laughs> so um, we pride ourselves in being evidence-based practice, as, as we know you're evidence-based physicians as well. And unfortunately, the field of regenerative medicine has attracted a lot of, um, I'll just call it riffraff. The FDA calls them bad actors, um, people who are uh, making unsubstantiated claims uh, and distributing products that, are un, um, that have not been tested for safety or efficacy. So um, these are just some of the textbooks that uh, Dr. Ambach and I have published chapters in. Um, you can get your hands on them. Uh, we think they're really great books. Um, we're starting to see more and more fellowship programs now in regenerative medicine, uh, Stanford, Mayo Clinic, um, many other programs have regenerative medicine. UCSD has a regenerative medicine program. Um, so this is, this is something now that um, continues to grow and the, the body of evidence continues to grow as well. So we've had real, we've had a lot of fun contributing to that. Um, this is our office, it's in Carlsbad, uh, California, right off the highway there. And um, we, um, we wanted to create a clinic that was comfortable uh, for us and for our patients um, and also had the tools that we needed <clears throat> to deliver this care. Um, on the lower right, whoop, go back, on the lower right, you see a, um, uh, our procedure room. Uh, so, you, you know, you see the C-arm and uh, we also have, uh, you know, ultrasound. Uh, so that's where we do a lot of our interventional procedures. Uh, this is a, a lab that we have also um, for processing tissue. Currently, we're only processing the FDA compliant products. So blood, bone marrow and adipose tissue processed in, uh, in accordance with FDA guidelines. Um, the research that we're doing, the FDA approved clinical trials, those are not FDA-approved drugs yet, so, so only our study patients can receive those uh, biologics. 
<clears throat> but there are FDA compliant versions of bone marrow and uh, adipose tissue, uh, which you're probably familiar with that we offer to our patients. Uh, we do a lot of manual processing um, in that hood. And then we also uh, do cell counts with a um, cytometer so we can be assured of what we're actually delivering to our patients. So again, this topic is gonna to cover uh, cell-based therapies with an emphasis on uh, blood, bone marrow, and adipose tissues uh, in, in orthopedic applications, specifically joint disease and tendon injuries. Uh, and then we just thought we'd share some of our anecdotal clinical experience because we've seen some really interesting cases. So orthobiologics is this term that refers to uh, uh, therapies that involve cells or molecules produced by those cells. And the most common ones that you hear about are PRP, which is which are you know platelet concentrate, uh, stem cells, which is a huge category, uh, various growth factors, protease inhibitors such as alpha two macroglobulin or IRAP, uh, and then you know large molecules such as um, collagen and fibrin. And so um, it seems like every year there are more and more papers. You can see that the PRP literature is growing. Uh, very rapidly. Uh, it's very hard to keep up, to be honest, uh, with all the new papers that have come out. Um, in addition, in the stem cell literature, there are a number of uh, papers coming out every year. Uh, we actually, um, I think this year we published seven papers. Um, so we're uh, not only spending time writing the paper, but trying to make time to read the paper. So it's, it's really a rapidly growing field. Um, that next slide shows all stem cell therapy, or this one shows all stem cell therapy. So you see tens of thousands of papers published every year on stem cells. Not all of that, of course, is related to um, orthopedics. And um, not all of it, of course, is, is clinical. A lot of it's preclinical or basic science papers. But um, there is a pretty abundant, robust literature in the orthopedic um, uh, uh, category. Uh, the uh, the first um, orthobiologic that was uh, introduced to orthopedic practice was platelet-rich plasma. And the definition of platelet-rich plasma is basically a concentrated dose of platelets. So if your baseline is 200,000 platelets per microliter, uh, anything greater than that number is considered platelet-rich plasma. And the number can range anywhere from one times baseline to 20 times baseline, depending on what your goals are. Uh, this is created by centrifuge and we separate the plasma from the red blood cells. And in between there, you have the Buffy coat, which contains the platelets, uh, leukocytes, uh, monocytes, other white, cell, um, white cells, uh, and granulocytes. Uh, and then <clears throat> these, uh, this allows us to concentrate uh, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, uh, various signaling molecules that have been shown to uh, accelerate the healing process. Um, I'll just, just toss in, you notice I said accelerates the healing process. So far, I'm not aware of a study that shows that PRP um, accelerates an acute healing of an acute injury, but we, we use it commonly in uh, injuries that have stalled out, that they're, they're incompletely healed. So that's the most common application. We typically aren't treating people, you know, six weeks or sooner after their injury. Um, so these are some of the better characterized growth factors that are stored in the alpha granules in the platelets. So you have the platelet-derived growth factor, the transforming growth factor beta, vascular endothelial growth factor. Each of these growth factors have unique properties that have been very well studied in the literature and um, have been shown to produce healing by, by a variety of mechanisms. On the next slide, uh, some of these mechanisms are described. And so the mechanisms of action may include an anti-inflammatory. Um, we didn't put it on there, but there's also cytokines that are pro-inflammatory. Uh, that can induce uh, cell differentiation or proliferation, increase extracellular matrix synthesis, uh, induce angiogenesis, uh, and also allow uh, MS, uh, stem cells to migrate to the site of injury. So unlike the drugs that we've been giving patients for 100 years, which generally have one or at most two mechanisms of action, uh, these are extremely complicated uh, treatments. And so uh, it makes the research extremely difficult to do because there are so many mechanisms of action to study and they may have varying effects. One of the challenges, other challenges of doing good research is that um, 
in spite of the fact that there are probably more than seven ways of categorizing the PRP that you were making, many studies still do not report uh, the method they used or um, uh, cell analysis of the PRP that they've actually used. So the better studies should indicate uh, how they made their PRP and, and what the cell counts were. And this just sort of drives home the point. This is a study that was done in, in France <clears throat> where a physician donated enough blood to generate eight different PRP samples through eight different methods of processing. You can see the company names at the bottom. So they invited the, the rep from the company to execute the SOP of their centrifuge system. And you can see not only is it visually different uh, with some uh, PRP solutions having very high red cell count, others having very low red cell count, but the platelet concentration varies significantly and the white cell concentration varies significantly. So we can't just call it PRP. We really need to be more specific uh, in our clinical trials. Skipping quickly now to the next orthobiologic, stem cells, <clears throat> another giant category. So just as with PRP, where not all PRP is created equal, not all stem cell therapies are created equal. And um, currently there are no FDA approved stem cell therapies for orthopedic applications. I am aware that in San Diego, there are at least half a dozen clinics that claim to sell stem cell therapies from uh, fetal tissues and donor tissues, but um, uh, rest assured that the FDA and the FBI and the Federal Trade Commission uh, are tracking down on these clinics because of the um, unsubstantiated claims that they're making and the fact that these are not FDA approved drugs and the FDA does consider donor uh, stem cells to be a drug. So they have to go through the regulatory pathways, you know, phase one, two, and three studies before they get an approved uh, biologic license application. Stem cells are exciting. You know, we got excited about stem cells in the 90s because they had this unique property when they go through mitosis, they don't just simply make two copies of themselves, but they have the ability to differentiate into a different cell type. And this is how our body basically repairs itself by generating new cells. Uh, so, you know, you have the embryonic stem cell, which is totally potent, which can turn into all the 200 plus different cell types in your body. But in our practice, we're not using embryonic stem cells. Obviously we're using what are called multipotent adult stem cells of which there are many different subcategories. The most uh, well-known is the hematopoietic stem cell, which is the basis of bone marrow transplant. So, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, they realized that patients who had uh, leukemia, lymphoma, who had been irradiated um, and had dysfunctional, you know, had inability to manufacture red cells, white cells, platelets, uh, that if you transplanted somebody else's bone marrow, that you could uh, reconstitute those cells. And that was because they had transplanted the hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, interestingly, the doctor that discovered uh, that first successfully performed um, the bone marrow transplant was almost uh, kicked out of the medical field by his peers. And then 10 years later, he got the Nobel Prize in medicine for his work in bone marrow transplant. So that's just sort of the way things go. You know, we're skeptical at first and then, and then and now it's just an accepted thing. Tens of thousands of lives have been saved by bone marrow transplant. And the same may be true for other types of stem cell therapy. So the stem cell that we're interested in is called the mesenchymal stem cell. And it's interesting to us in orthopedics because it can differentiate into different cell types, bone, tendon, cartilage, and muscle. And the man who discovered that is a guy named uh, Arnold Kaplan, shown here. He's a professor of biology at Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio, and he's one of our mentors. And he first demonstrated in the Petri dish in the lab that the um, chicken uh, MSC, the mesenchymal stem cell, could differentiate into a chondrocyte, myocyte, neuron, uh, adipocyte, and other um, mesenchymal type tissues. Uh, and so everyone got excited. They're off to the races. He actually created a company um, that actually didn't produce any products for more than 15 years because it turned out it was much more complicated than this. In the human body, excuse me, next slide. In the human body, these MSCs, these mesenchymal stem cells, even though they're called stem cells, Dr. Kaplan doesn't want us to call them stem cells anymore. He wants us to call them medicinal signaling cells because they are functioning like little pharmacies in the body. Even though they do have the ability to differentiate in the Petri dish, in the human body, what they really do is uh, when activated by things such as trauma uh, or disease, 
processes, they will uh, start manufacturing uh, uh, cytokines, chemokines, um, growth factors, very similar to platelets, uh, which have trophic effects, immunomodulatory effects, and even antimicrobial effects. Uh, this is kind of a cool little video. This is a, a zebra fish with a wound, and um, the MSC is actually able to migrate from the blood vessel. So it's, it's sleeping on your microvasculature, and then when it senses uh, trauma, such in this case as a wound on the surface of the skin, the MSC will actually migrate to the wound site, which is the um, induration that you see when you cut, you know, you get a paper cut, you get a little red bump. Uh, those are cells migrating to the injury site. A lot of that triggered initially uh, by platelets releasing their growth factors. And so they create this chemokine uh, effect on the MSC. So as I mentioned, uh, embry embryonic stem cells, while used in the literature and in some clinical trials, uh, they are currently not permitted in the clinic. And so we are using adult stem cells that are derived from uh, our own patient, or it's called autologous. Uh, and as I already al alluded, uh, birth tissue derived cells uh, are currently not FDA approved. Uh, they, are, they have been studied minimally in the orthopedic literature. I think there's maybe one or two uh, prospective randomized clinical trials. So um, the safety and efficacy of these products remains to be proven. Uh, and, and it's probably gonna meet, be a moot point because um, this year FDA finally decided they're gonna crack down on the manufacturers of these products and the FBI and Federal Trade Commission are cracking down on the clinics that sell these products illegally. So hopefully this will become a thing of the past. And going forward, we'll have, you know, we'll have FDA approved drugs. And, and I'm not saying that these amniotic derived uh, tissues or umbilical cord tissues aren't gonna have a role. There's actually a nice study showing that umbilical cord derived stem cells can be effective for COVID patients. Uh, but again, these are not FDA approved and we're not allowed to sell them. Uh, what we are allowed to do, uh, in, which is in compliance with the current FDA regulatory guidance, is, uh, is a minimal manipulation of a patient's own tissue for that patient. So we can uh, extract bone marrow from the patient and, or we can extract adipose tissue through a simple liposuction procedure uh, in the office uh, and then concentrate those cells and administer those cells. Uh, this is not stem cell therapy. I've, I'm familiar. There are websites that say, you know, come get your bone marrow stem cell therapy. I remind everybody that bone marrow is 99.9% .9 not stem cells. Uh, there's a lot of platelets in there. There's a lot of hematopoietic stem cells, but the actual MSC uh, is less than a tenth to a hundredth of uh, a percent. Uh, nonetheless, there are other factors in the bone marrow, other um, cells and other molecules that have been shown to be effective, and Dr. Ambach is going to talk about that. Uh, and then adipose tissue uh, can have up to 20% of the cells, the nucleated cells, can be the adipose-derived MSC, uh, um, and it varies from patient to patient and, and by where you collect the fat from. Uh, but as I mentioned, we, are, we have been using this in the clinic now for about seven years, uh, and we've actually uh, published quite a bit on the clinical outcomes uh, of those treatments. So we'll talk about, talk about that a little bit. You know, uh, caveat in power, first do no harm. We took an oath. So, um, you know, before we offer treatments to our patients, we want to see published uh, safety studies. These are some of the more well-known published safety studies. Uh, Chris Centeno is a physiatrist who started a company called Regenex and was the first in the US to administer bone marrow concentrate to patients for orthopedic applications. He uh, published this paper in 2016. It's an old paper now, but it was 2,000 patients that he followed for almost nine years and showed no serious adverse events. Uh, he actually has a registry with a much larger number of patients now. Um, Dr. Hernigal, uh, in the middle there is uh, an orthopedic uh, surgeon in Paris, France, who's one of our uh, godfathers of cell therapy, if you will. In 2013, he published 13-year uh, uh, follow-up data on uh, 1,800 patients who had been treated uh, with non-union fractures or osteoarthritis, uh, tendon injuries, et cetera, using bone marrow concentrate. And he actually did repeat MRI, repeat X-ray on all these patients and showed no uh, increased risk of cancer. Actually, the incidence of cancer was lower than the, than the population uh, standard. 
Uh, and then there's this other study that shows um, uh, stromal vascular fraction, which is a type of adipose derived cell product that um, showed no serious adverse events as well. All right, Dr. Hanbach, All right. share some of the literature with us. Thank you again, everybody, for um, joining us this afternoon. Um, there is probably more than 70 um, randomized controlled clinical trials showing the safety and efficacy of a PRP or platelet-rich plasma for orthopedic conditions. Uh, there's several level one studies uh, showing the use of PRP for joint osteoarthritis. Uh, with regards to the preclinical pre studies, uh, PRP showed that there's uh, that it increases um, chondrocyte and extracellular matrix production. It inhibits inflammation. It uh, encourages or attracts um, mesenchymal stem cells to go to the region of injury. And um, aside from the anti-inflammatory effect, uh, it actually helps pain uh, probably through the upregulation of uh, mRNA levels of cannabinoid receptors. So these are just some of the studies that we're gonna be uh, presenting. Um, this is a meta-analysis of 15 randomized controlled clinical trials comparing PRP with HA. And it did show that uh, the PRP group reduced the pain more effectively and had better functional outcomes than the HA group. Uh, another meta-analysis of 14 uh, different randomized controlled clinical trials comparing PRP with more traditional treatments um, like hyaluronic acid or steroid injections. And uh, their conclusion was that the intraarticular PRP treatment was more effective uh, in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis in terms of pain relief and functional improvement compared to the different controls. This is a study um, that compared uh, PRP with exercise versus exercise alone. And it was a double-blind randomized controlled clinical trial. Patients with uh, mild to moderate osteoarthritis, Kelgren, Lawrence, one to three. Um, and not only did it show that the PRP group showed better improvement in their uh, pain and uh, functional outcome scores, but the PRP group also showed objective evidence of improvement in the cartilage volume uh, improvement in the synovitis and also in the meniscus integrity of the joint. This is a study uh, using bone marrow derived cells for knee osteoarthritis. It was a, a randomized controlled trial, again, comparing BMAC bone marrow concentrate versus a series of three hyaluronic acid injections. And it did show that the bone marrow treated cells, um, I'm sorry, bone marrow uh, cells uh, treated in the knee showed a statistically significant improvement in both their CUSI scores and K KSS scales uh, up to one year compared to the control. This is another study that is also a randomized controlled clinical trial with a two-year follow-up and it compared um, exercise versus a bone marrow concentrate with BRP products. And um, at three months, it did show that the bone marrow concentrate group or the cell therapy group uh, showed significant improvement in the patient's pain, range of motion, and activity. And uh, they did a crossover design wherein the, the exercise group crossed over to the cell therapy group. And they found that this crossover group did better than the exercise group at three months. All these clinical improvements were sustained throughout two years and there was no serious adverse events. This is a study that was published uh, by Dr. Rogers and a group of other um, scientists all over the world. It was the largest study of using uh, lipogems adipose derived cell therapy for uh, moderate to severe knee osteoarthritis, 75 patients, 120 knees, uh, one injection of lipogems into the knees um, with a follow-up of two years and their findings showed 88% had a significant, 88% uh, of the patients a significant improvement of pain and 91% of the patients that were enrolled were able to avoid surgery. Um, there are several studies that has shown objective evidence or imaging uh, guidance uh, evidence of improvement in the cartilage quality after a cell derived therapy. This is a study that uh, used bone marrow cells um, and they actually did a quantitative MRI T2 mapping um, to assess the cartilage quality. 
the yellow and the orange um, areas that are pointed by the white arrows are the um, less uh, quality cartilage, which has uh, inflammatory tissue and degenerated uh, cartilage. And after treatment, um, the MRIs uh, post-treatment showed that there was less of this poor quality uh, cartilage. I think this was six months, I can't remember. I think you're right. And I think it's measuring the proteoglycan content. Oh, this is this one, this next one. This, this next one is uh, using a processed adipose uh, tissue and um, they use a, a gadolinium enhanced MRI uh, to assess the, the cartilage quality, but they also measured the um, glycosaminoglycans in the hyaline cartilage. And they did show that at least half of the patients uh, improve uh, in cartilage quality and also improve in the content of the, um, the proteins in the hyaline cartilage. This is a uh, arthroscopic um, picture of a degenerated uh, cartilage. As you can see on the left side, you can see the uh, cartilage lesion in the middle femoral condyle uh, of an elderly patient uh, treated with um, cell therapy, adipose uh, cell therapy. And uh, after a year, uh, when they did a second look arthroscopy, they have shown uh, growth of cartilage into the lesion and a smooth uh, tissue, which um, they found to be cartilage uh, that um, covered the original um, lesion and maintained uh, cartilage status throughout the um, follow-up of the study. Um, moving on to uh, tendinopathy and tendon injuries, the, um, the use of PRP uh, has more robust uh, clinical uh, trials or evidence um, in uh, treating um, lateral epicondylitis or common extensor uh, tendinopathy. This is the earliest uh, high quality study that was done for chronic ten tennis elbow. And this was done by Alan Mishra, who was an orthopedic surgeon in Stanford. Um, he did a double blind um, multicenter randomized controlled clinical trial of 230 patients. Uh, their control was uh, dry needling with bupivacaine and they um, uh, compared this with uh, patients who were also dry needling with uh, PRP. And they found that at 24 weeks, the PRP group had uh, better uh, VASA scores or pain scores. And they also found that the PRP group had um, better success rate. Um, as you can see in the graph on the right, 82% compared to 60%. Um, success rate at 24 weeks, and their success is um, defined as uh, at least 50% improvement in their function. Um, we, the, the study recommended that um, physicians should try um, PRP first before con considering a surgery for um, chronic tennis elbow or, or chronic um, lateral condylitis because of similar outcomes with um, less side effects and less cost. Most of the studies on um, PRP for tendon injuries um, support the use of uh, leukocyte-rich PRP, and um, that's because of uh, the immunomodulatory effect of the leuc leukocytes, uh, their chemoattractant um, property uh, to attract not just growth factors, but also MSCs to the region of injury, and um, also uh, the function of the macrophages with regards to removing a, necre and a necrotic tissue and debris into the um, disease tendon. This is the study, um, which is a systematic review of 16 randomized controlled clinical trials on uh, all different kinds of tendinopathy, uh, symptomatic tendinopathy, more than 700 patients, um, which they compared with um, uh, PRP versus uh, traditional treatments like local anesthesia or steroid. And they did show that the injection of PRP was more effective than control injections uh, for symptomatic tendinopathy. And the follow-up was uh, two years. Another uh, tendinopathy that works, that uh, PRP works really well, uh, at least that we see also in clinical practice is uh, gluteal tendinopathy. Uh, patients with um, the common uh, tendon, uh, common, I'm sorry, conjoint tendon uh, in the hamstring, um, or 
um, uh, glutamid or glutmax uh, tendon pairs or tendinopathy do really well with just one injection of PRP. Uh, this particular study is a randomized controlled clinical trial of 80 patients using Luxite-rich PRP versus steroid, and the PRP group uh, did have a better improvement of pain and function with the PRP injection, and this was maintained for up to two years. We've actually been seeing uh, longer than two years um, improvement for these patients, uh, but most of the studies have only had um, two-year follow-up. Uh, with regards to rotator cuff tears and rotator cuff tendinopathy, the literature has been mixed. Um, our clinical experience has been really good for partial rotator cuff tears and um, tendinopathy. Uh, this is a study which is a level two uh, evidence perspective cohort study, uh, 50 patients who had refractory rotator cuff tendinopathy with, um, who underwent one PRP injection. Patients did well, they had better um, sleep, they had better pain scores and function scores, and 84% uh, of those uh, patients were able to return to their sports. This is now using bone marrow injection, again, for a common extensor tendinopathy. Um, patients did really well with their functional outcomes with just one injection. Um, another bone marrow study um, for the use of uh, rotator cuff uh, tendon tears and tendinopathy. This study uh, also included the glenohumeral joint injection for uh, glenohumeral joint osteoarthritis. And uh, they have shown that uh, the patients had improvement in their functional outcomes in their DASH scores and their pain scores. This is a patient of ours with a um, common extensor, uh, partial common extensor tendon tear. As you can see on the left, the, the hypoechoic signal um, which is uh, showing you the partial tear uh, right at the attachment of the lateral condyle. Uh, you can also see that the tendon is thickened. Um, and after one PRP injection uh, in six months, there's almost complete resolution of that uh, partial tear. And you can also see that the tendon thickness uh, improve. I think this was the first patient in San Diego to get PRP. I treated him more than 13 or 14 years ago. And he's still, he's my friend and he's, his elbow still doesn't hurt. <laughs> and he's still my friend. <laughs> <laughs> this is another uh, patient who um, had more uh, severe tear, more than 50% tear in her um, lateral, um, I'm sorry, common extensor tendon. And um, she didn't want to undergo surgery. So uh, we did adipose tissue cell therapy for her. And um, after five months, there's uh, almost complete resolution of the tear here, um, as you can see on the right. And uh, she was back to playing pickleball, which is what her goal was for the treatment. Uh, another patient of ours who has a uh, supraspinatus uh, partial tendon tear uh, at the footprint. Uh, you can see the partial tear on the uh, picture on the right there. And after one injection of PRP, patient did really well. Uh, this is the four months um, picture with a complete resolution of the supraspinatus there. Um, this is actually the, uh, our professional uh, golf player um, who did not want to go uh, surgery because he had an upcoming tournament. He had a large tendon tear. We recommended surgery, but uh, he didn't want to pursue it. So we did adipose tissue cell therapy um, and uh, did really well. In fact, he went back to playing the tournament two months after the injection and did really well. And this was the, the after uh, picture, one year after the injection, you can see that the, the tear healed. This was also his uh, supraspinatus tendon. And that was a full thickness tear. I did not expect that outcome at all. I told him, I told him it might help with pain, but I didn't know if it was going to do anything for a full thickness tear. It was, and it was retracted. It was retracted more than a, a half centimeter, which is why we were recommending surgery. Um, but anyway, it was a pretty surprising outcome. Um, this is a, a professional soccer player who had a pretty significant patellar tendon tear. Um, and we uh, did an adipose tissue cell therapy on him uh, three months after. You can see the after uh, picture here, did really well, went back to playing soccer, no issues. Uh, this is an arthroscopic picture of a rotator cuff tear. Uh, as you can see on the left, the degenerated uh, tendon tissue and the tear uh, in the upper picture here. And after six months of cell therapy, 
you can see the shiny glossy uh, tendon um, fibers um, that covered the initial area of tear and injury. Um, we did uh, have several publications on uh, intradiscal cell therapy and also uh, knee uh, joint osteoarthritis. We have ongoing clinical trials on the use of PRP and bone marrow um, aspirate for uh, degenerative discs. And uh, as Dr. Rogers mentioned, uh, ongoing uh, clinical trial on uh, use of uh, adipose cell therapy for knee osteoarthritis. And we have our, we have our, um, we're starting to get our one year follow up data on that study, but it's not published yet. So that's why we didn't really put down the information. So it hasn't been sub submitted to peer review yet, but um, I can just share with you anecdotally that we asked their satisfaction at one year follow up as well as Coos and Womack and a lot of other things. But in a nutshell, no, no um, serious adverse events. The, all the adverse events essentially were just, you know, soreness for a couple of days, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we were monitoring uh, your analysis, CBC, you know, it's an FDA trial. So we were looking at everything, no, no um, negative effects on their health, fortunately, and 75% satisfaction at one year follow-up. And these were patients with severe uh, Kelgren threes and four, NEOA, um, pretty bad knees actually. So how long it will last, we don't know. Um, I, our general gestalt is that all these cell therapies, um, with the exceptions of the tendons, the tendons when they heal, as long as the patient doesn't re-injure the tendon, they do really well for long, for years and years. And I've been following patients for more than a decade now. Um, for knee osteoarthritis, you know, it's an ongoing disease, it's very complex. Most of these patients probably will need some kind of repeat treatment around three or four years would be my guess, but that data is still, you know, being collected. That is slight, yeah. So we, uh, in order for us to move this field um, forward, we have to collect data, and the data is not perfect yet. Um, but we're contributing by uh, collecting uh, data from our patients. All our patients who undergo regenerative therapy gets um, uh, inputted into our data biologics uh, registry, and we follow them uh, in specific um, a few months of follow up after the their treatment and it just gives us a, um, an objective uh, data to present to our patients when they ask us, for example, what's your two year outcome for uh, moderate arthritis using you know, bone marrow cell therapy, for example. So it's a good, um, it's a, a, a good uh, tool for us to use and hopefully we can also use it to, uh, for insurance purposes so that we can uh, get this approved hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, let's answer and, some questions. Yeah, I think that's it. Let me see, I'm gonna stop the share. And uh, whoever has question, raise your hand and I will, or type your question. And I can, if you raise your hand, I will uh, unmute you so you can talk. Oh, nice. Chris has a question. He says, is there an optimal time for these injections after a tear? So I'm assuming you're talking about a tendon tear. Um, uh, long story short, because these are still new therapies, um, even though you know we've shown some good outcomes and the published literature also supports that, we still exhaust standard of care first. These, these treatments are not covered by insurance. So we're gonna use their, um, you know, their, uh, you know, we're physiatrists first, right? I, I mean, I was a, physiatrist for whatever, 20 years before regenerative medicine came out, maybe not that long, but <laughs> I injected a lot of steroid, we'll just put it that way. And, uh, you know, recommended a lot of physical therapy and I still do those things. Uh, but I would say, you know, you have a general sense of how long it should take for a patient to recover from a partial rotator cuff tendon tear or an acute meniscal tear or something like that. And if they're, if they're plateauing and if they're not responding to standard of care, that's when you start considering some of these newer therapies. So I don't think there's an optimal time. Uh, so it's just that's just sort of our guideline. You also asked about um, regenerative injections for discs. Dr. Patrick, Ambach yeah. can speak to that. Yeah, so Patrick asked any research on disc disease. Yeah. Um, yes, there are. Uh, there's a lot of research on PRP for uh, intradiscal therapy. And there's one um, level one randomized controlled clinical trial, which uh, did really well. And they published their two-year data, and they just did a follow-up uh, publication, which is actually five to nine-year data, um, showing that the patients are still improved and sustained their functional outcomes and their pain scores 
up to five to nine years, which is pretty amazing. You know, I don't know of any non-surgical treatment that we have right now that can last that long. Um, uh, a lot of the other PRP interdiscal uh, studies are all case series. We publish one uh, using PRP and uh, bone marrow um, and patients decrease their medication use, um, which I know is, is, is a great uh, tool to have um, for uh, patients who are, have chronic spine pain. Um, also lots of studies on uh, bone marrow uh, derived cell therapy. Most of the studies though are cultured cells uh, on bone marrow. Uh, there are some um, studies also that has shown that has used bone marrow concentrate uh, and one of those publications are, are, are ours and the patients uh, did really well. Uh, only one randomized controlled clinical trial that I know using bone marrow cells, the rest are all prospective case series. Um, there's probably one that is uh, adipose derived uh, cells, uh, but uh, not much on the, uh, on the adipose uh, cell therapy for intradiscal use. And what the cell therapy showed was it did increase, um, at least preclinically, they did show um, improvement in the disc hydration. They did show improvement in disc heights in some of these patients. Uh, it decreased the pain by decreasing the inflammatory mediators. There was some resolution of the annular tears. Um, at least in our clinical experience, um, we wanna do these procedures in patients who have at least 50% disc height. Uh, and that's because if their discs are far gone, you know, they, they don't do uh, really well with these therapies. Yeah, you have the modified Furman, well, you have the Furman scale, uh, which assesses the degree of disc degeneration. And we're, we're pretty much focusing on those threes and fours. Um, we also like small annular tears in young people. As you know, annular tears are extremely difficult to treat. You know, you're not going to fuse a young person's spine if they fail rehab or whatever else you offer them. Uh, PRP has been very good for those um, very focal, you know, you see the high intensity zone on the MRI, patients has pain with sitting flexion, that kind of thing. Um, they do very well. The, um, but, you know, for patients who are unstable, you know, if they have a uh, spondylolisthesis that's unstable, or if they have just really advanced disease, or if they have, you know, severe stenosis, those, we don't really touch those patients. Um, uh, unless for some reason they can't undergo, you know, surgery or something like that, we'll try it. But the success rate is not very high. The other thing I'll add is, um, as you know, uh, you know, when I was doing my fellowship, uh, we believed in a pain generator. It's like you, you have facet joint pain, or you have disc pain, or you have radicular pain, and that's it. Well, we know that's all. That's baloney. Um, we know that um, by the time the disc starts to generate, there's already ligament laxity. There's, you know, multi there may be tendon injuries and ligament injuries that we can't even see on MRI or on ultrasound. Um, so we're believing now that this is a segmental disease. We're not going to call it, I'm not going to call it disc disease. I'm going to call it segmental disease. And it's very hard to design a study where you're injecting discs and ligaments and facet joint capsules and, uh, you know, trying to control all these variables. So, but in clinical practice, there is evidence that um, you need to treat the whole segment. You can't just treat the disc. So if you have a patient with, you know, uh, a modic, I mean, with a um, Furman three or four, um, we're probably going to treat the whole segment, uh, meaning we're going to inject into those facet joint capsules, those ligaments, um, and uh, and the disc as well. And you can actually start seeing the trend, Chris. There's there's one uh, PRP publication already using a, a multi-target PRP injection. There's a study that we I just submitted for publication also using multi-target PRP injection for a low back pain. And then um, also another one in the works using bone marrow concentrate. So that will be uh, very excited to see. Um, a follow-up for the disc question. Um, how many degenerative discs are too many to practically treat degenerative disc disease? <laughs> uh, we, in my clinical experience, and I think uh, Chris has the same, we inject anywhere from one to three at the time. Right. Anything more than three, I think it's too much for the body to heal from um, and uh, too much for the patient. Painful. Um, These are painful. Yes. You know, I don't know if you guys do discography, but you know, it's the same concept. You're injecting volume and we try to concentrate our biologic as much as possible so it's a low volume, so it doesn't create a lot of pain. And, and obviously we don't wanna propagate the tear or you know, cause further injury to the disc. Um, we don't inject contrast typically, although I've done thousands of discograms, apparently injecting contrast in disc was a bad idea. So um, you know, we just confirmed on fluoroscopy that we're in the nucleus and, um, 
and then we inject our biologic. But it's, it's an uncomfortable procedure. Patients are sore for about a week, roughly afterwards. Um, we do, you know, give them uh, limitations uh, in that first week. But we've had patients with multi-level disease. Uh, I'm thinking of a couple right off the top of my head <clears throat> who had three bad looking discs and who, were, who responded well. I think the patients who don't respond well are the ones that we missed the disc. You know, they had an annular tear at a level that didn't look bad on the MRI and we missed it somehow. So it's, um, it's, these are clinically challenging cases. Chris, I'll let you take these next two questions. They're, they're kind of related. Um, so how much infrastructure is needed to get PRP or stem cells ready to inject? And really, <laughs> kind of related with Mark's question, what will it take for a large organization like Kaiser to adopt these therapies? Oh, it's not the infrastructure, it's all the red tape you got to get through. It's, you know, <laughs> firstly, you have data on your side now. So you can say, look, we've got, you know, published studies, we've got uh, evidence that, you know, if you want to start just with injecting PRP in the knee and in the elbow, you've got plenty of literature support to do that. You don't need anything really more than um, one of these off-the-shelf centrifuge kits. These are, um, they have, you know, they have their 510K clearance from the FDA and you're sort of making PRP off-label with that centrifuge, but it is permitted and the FDA is not really cracking down on clinics who use it. So I think it's, I think you're covered. Um, the, uh, you know, if you, if you want to take the extra step and you can see behind Dr. Rombach, you can see our hood. You know, we're doing manual processing, okay. we're doing okay. cell counts, you know, it's a little more, a little more involved, um, but it, it's not difficult to do. Um, it's not a, I think it's a good idea to have a cell counter um, in your lab because now you can validate you are indeed making PRP and, and the type of PRP that you want to make. Um, you know, if you're going to do any kind of thing, these exotic things that Dr. Ambach is doing, injecting into discs or injecting in the subchondral bone, you know, in our patients with bone marrow lesions on their knee MRI. Uh, that's done in a surgery center, right? Under fluoroscopic guidance with MAC anesthesia. So that's a little more involved. But for your simple PRP stuff, you could get started tomorrow with a centrifuge and a phlebotomist and an ultrasound machine. Hi, James. Thank you for your question. Uh, so James asked, is prolotherapy part of your treatment? Yes, it is. Uh, we use it a lot for uh, SI joint uh, dysfunction. Uh, we also use it for joint osteoarthritis. We use it for ligament laxity. Uh, they do really well. I mean, you know, these are all cash-based procedures and uh, prolotherapy is definitely uh, more cost-effective for some patients. So for uh, less um, involved lesions, uh, we do offer our prolotherapy. Yeah, if you have you know, really trusted physical therapists, because it's really difficult to diagnose uh, sacral leg joint dysfunction. Um, actually, I think one of the first patients in the country to be treated with PRP was my wife. I treated her more than 10 years ago uh, with PRP. She, um, she had a classic SIJ dysfunction, um, had injured her um, ligaments in, a, in an injury. And um, her clinical history was, you know, she would get rehab, she would brace, she'd be okay. And then a year later, she would you know, have symptoms again. So we kind of were on this merry-go-round as you've probably had with many of your patients that have chronic ligament injuries. Uh, it's really difficult because you don't see that on MRI. It's kind of hard to see even on ultrasound. Uh, so if you have a physical therapist you can trust and say, you know, look, we keep mobilizing this patient and they're good for a week or a month or whatever. And then they are um, re-injuring themselves. That's a patient who probably has a chronic injury that needs to be treated with PRP. And we treat the entire, um, ligament complex, you know, so the long dorsal, the, the posterior SIJ, the sacral tuberous, because we don't really know which ligament is injured. And, and typically we're not injecting into the joint unless they have synovitis or, you know, some objective evidence of joint um, pathology. Most of these patients in my experience that I'm talking about right now are just chronic ligament injuries. And um, the results have been extremely good. Um, there's actually a couple of published papers. We didn't present them, but um, you can find those. All right, what conditions do you have the best effect with biologics? Um, really good uh, with knee osteoarthritis, mild to moderate knee osteoarthritis do really, really well with PRP. Uh, common extensor tendinopathy, lateral condylitis do really well with PRP as well. Other uh, uh, less um, involved tendinopathy or partial tendon tears like um, uh, glute uh, tendinopathy, patellar tendinopathy, Achilles, 
um, plantar fascia and rotator cuff actually do really well with PRP. And usually the soft tissue ones, they all they only need one uh, injection. Uh, the joints, you know, it really depends. There's no consensus yet on how many injections are best. Uh, for more severe uh, joint OA, uh, we tend to favor the cell-based therapy, either adipose-derived or bone marrow-derived. Um, and uh, the knee joints do the best, uh, would you say, Chris? And then hip? Knees do better than hips. Shoulder, unfortunately, yeah. most of the shoulders we see are pretty bad shoulders. And so it's not so much, I mean, there is a tendency for certain joints and certain tendons to be better. Like clearly the knee does better than the hip. Uh, Achilles tendon, for whatever reason, does really well, uh, you know, if it's not a, you know, huge tear. Uh, we're talking with PRP now. Um, so there is some of that where some tendons and some joints respond better than others if, you know, severity being equal. Uh, but clearly the, the single greatest predictor of outcome is severity of disease. And so, you know, if, if you know, we showed you that really huge common extensor tendon tear, uh, way too big for PRP to work. Uh, that's why we injected adipose cells. Wasn't even sure if that was gonna work, had a really great outcome. So um, there, are, there are people that are clearly too far gone, you know, people who have, you know, Kelgren four knees with 15 degrees of valgus, you know, and are unstable, um, they're not gonna do very well with cell therapy. They need a knee replacement. Um, so, you know, that's, that's as important to know, you know, what's the limit of the, you know, these therapies, because you don't want to waste your time, energy, and their money uh, and expose them to risk if it's not, not going to work. Um, right. Having said that, we've had some really crazy home runs that were completely unexpected, like 88-year-old Kelgren four knees bilaterally, no pain, you know, four years later. So there's enough, there's lots of questions that we have to answer still. You asked about greater trochanteric pain. Um, so when I was, you know, in residency, you know, everybody who had lateral hip pain had bursitis, right? And then we got this great tool called ultrasound and we realized, oh, these people don't have bursitis. These people have glute med tears, right? So if they have, you know, partial to moderate size glute medius tear, they're great PRP candidates if they don't get better with standard of care. Do not inject steroids in those tendons, please. There's enough evidence that shows that we don't want to do that every now and then we'll put a little tiny mini dose of steroid into a bursa or into a joint. But, but uh, there's really no good evidence that injecting steroid into a tendon is good for it long-term. And there's a lot of evidence that PRP will last longer and, and it's probably healthier for that tendon. That's right. We missed one question here. Uh, oh. Sorry, Chris. Is there an optimal time for these inject injections after a tear onset of injury? Um, well, as uh, Chris mentioned, um, we don't do this acutely. You know, in the injury process, usually we, we do the standard treatments for the first six to eight weeks. Um, we've seen the whole gamut of patients from, you know, three months injury to years after uh, the injury, uh, and they, they still do really well. Uh, again, it, it's really the severity of the disease that um, determines their, um, their functional outcome and efficacy. So there, there's, there hasn't been any uh, data that says you can only do it for you know, subacute or um, a certain amount of time. They, you know, they can have injuries from long before and they still do well with the treatment. And there's been a few studies, like I remember there's a study on hamstring tears in soccer players and they injected PRP acutely and it didn't really make a difference in the natural history. So there aren't a lot of studies like that, but the studies that are out there show that it probably doesn't accelerate natural um, uh, healing. Um, what am I trying to say? The, the natural course of the injury. However, there probably are some patients where um, it, it will make a difference, but you don't know them until they've already failed standard care. Right. The cost uh, varies. So for PRP, it's anywhere from 500 to 1600. Um, for the cell-based therapy, it's anywhere from 2000 to 10,000. It just depends on um, uh, how many uh, regions we are treating. Do they need sedation? Does it need to be in the surgery center? You know, is it the spine? So there, there's a lot of variability. Um, but repeat injections, you know, they do get discounts, or if it's multiple uh, body regions at the time, they do get the discounted for the uh, subsequent regions. Yeah, we're very cost conscious, and, um, and these treatments are not cheap to deliver. Um, and, I'll, and just like I showed you on that PRP slide, where not all PRP is created equal, 
The same is true with bone marrow concentrate and adipose cell. We didn't tease out all that. We didn't get into the weeds on that, but there's at least there's at least five different ways to process adipose tissue. And some of those studies that you saw use different techniques. So we didn't get into the weeds on that. But um, uh, and with bone marrow, there's a right way and a wrong way to collect bone marrow. You don't just you know you can't just stick a needle in the in the iliac crest and suck out marrow. There's a, a technique that Dr. Ambach and I had to learn. Um, it's not rocket science, but if you do it the wrong way, you're going to get a bad result. So we're very, we've invested a lot of time and energy and money in learning how to do it the right way. And um, that also accounts for some of the cost of the treatment. All right. I think that's it. Thank you so much for um, um, your time, for listening to us, for finally making this happen. Patty, thank you for um, organizing this. And if you have any more questions, just feel free to reach out to us. Uh, Patty knows our contact number. You know my email address, so feel free to uh, reach out. Good night. Looking Bye -bye. forward to meeting you guys in person someday. Bye. Bye.